Okay, so let's talk about facial nerve, the seventh cranial nerve. This is the midbrain, this is the pons, this is the medulla. The seventh cranial nerve has three important nuclei and fibers coming from three important locations. So this is the motor nucleus of the seventh nerve right here in the pons. It moves backwards, circles around the nucleus of the sixth nerve, and then continues forward. As it comes out of the brain stem, it enters the internal acoustic meatus and at the level of the geniculate ganglion it makes another turn. So you can think of this as an S. So the first turn is around the sixth nerve nucleus which is right here and the seventh nerve, uh, the motor nucleus of the seventh nerve gives off fibers that go circle the sixth nerve nucleus which is the abducens nucleus and go out. These enter the internal acoustic meatus and at the level of the geniculate ganglion, they make another turn, they go backwards again, and then start moving down. There are some fibers that are given out at this level, and this is the nerve to the stipedius muscle. So stipedius muscle helps dampen, dampen loud sounds. And we'll discuss what happens if someone has an insult to the nerve to the stipedius. So the nerve then continues downwards, it leaves the skull through the stylomastoid foramen and then once it leaves the stylomastoid foramen so let's presume that this is a stylomastoid foramen okay so it leaves down here it gives off a couple of branches I'm not going to discuss too much about those two branches one is the branch to the posterior belly of the digastric and the other one is to the stylohyoid muscle and the motor fibers then continue pass through the parotid gland and are supplied to the different motor, different muscles of facial expression. So this is the motor part of the seventh nerve. Now keep in mind the seventh nerve also has other fibers. So there is, okay, let's say this is the superior salivatory nucleus. So superior salivatory nucleus gives, fi gives parasympathetic fibers. So the parasympathetic fibers continue and follow the motor, motor nerve of the seventh. At the level of the geniculate ganglion, some fibers continue forward and these fibers synapse in the pterygopalatine ganglion. So this is the pterygopalatine ganglion. And from the pterygopalatine ganglion, some fibers go to the lacrimal gland. So let's presume that this is the eyeball. This is the pupil over here. So this is the pupil. And the lacrimal gland is somewhere over here. And then the, you have your nose over here and this is the nose. So some fibers from the pterygopalatine ganglion go to the lacrimal gland and some fibers go into the nasal mucosa. Now the parasympathetic fibers then continue down. These continue with the motor fibers. These pass the nerve to the stapedius. And at this level, the fibers enter the cauda tympani nerve. The cauda tympani nerve then, and through the cauda tympani nerve, these fibers continue all the way to the submandibular gland. So in the submandibular gland, these fibers come here and these synapse here. From the sub, I'm sorry, not the submandibular gland, but the submandibular ganglion. From the submandibular ganglion, fibers go, some fibers go to underneath the tongue to the sublingual sal salivary gland, and other fibers go to the submandibular gland. So there are submandibular glands and sublingual glands. So these are the parasympathetic fibers. Now there is a third set of fibers. These fibers carry the sensory fibers. So nucleus of tractus solitarius is over here. And from the nucleus of tractus solitarius, these fibers continue with the seventh nerve. At the level of the geniculate ganglion, there is some synapse. There is a synapse that happens over here. And these fibers just continue, follow down, and then enter the cauda tympani nerve and along with the cauda tympani nerve these continue these join the 
lingual nerve that comes from the fifth nerve and supply taste to the anterior two third of the tongue. So this is the taste to the anterior two third of the tongue. Now why is it important to understand that there are three different fibers that travel along with the seventh nerve? Well, I'll give you a very good reason just in a minute. Okay, so let's, let me just pick up a different color here and I'll pick this color here. Okay, this is an indigo color. Now, if a person has a lesion in the brain stem or in the pons, so let's say if a person has a lesion in the pons over here, there is a chance that there will be a lower motor neuron type of facial nerve weakness along with the sixth nerve weakness. So this is lesion one. And if you have a sixth nerve lesion along with the seventh nerve lesion, you can suspect that the problem is in the brains uh, in the brain stem. Let's say if a lesion is over here, this is level two. So the sixth nerve would be spared because the brain stem is not involved. Seventh nerve will be affected along with eighth nerve that accompanies the seventh nerve till the internal acoustic meatus. So if somebody has a seventh nerve palsy and problems with eighth nerve as manifested by problems with hearing and vertigo, you can suspect that the lesion is after it after the seventh nerve exits the brainstem and while it's about to enter or just entering the internal acoustic meatus. Okay? And these kind of lesions, when they affect the seventh nerve, they will affect lacrimation. It will affect the taste to the anterior two third of the tongue. It will affect, it will cause hyperacusis by involving the nerve to the stapedius, and as well, it will cause facial weakness. Okay, let's move on. Let's say the lesion is at this level now. So this is level three. So if a lesion is at this level, it will not affect the sixth nerve, it will not affect the eighth nerve, and it will spare lacrimation. But it will cause hyper hyperacusis by paralyzing the nerve to stapedius. It will affect the taste on the anterior two third of the tongue, and it will cause facial nerve uh, facial muscle paralysis. If the level is a little more distal to it, so level 4. This will have the same effects as a lesion at the level of the, uh, at level 3 other than sparing the nerves to stapedius so the patient will not have hyperacusis. If the lesion is after the so this is level 5 if the lesion is distal to the caudal tympani nerve it will spare the taste in the anterior two third of the tongue and only affect the muscles of facial expression. So this is the reason it's extremely important that you need to understand that if a lesion is in the brainstem, so in quick summary, if the lesion is in the brainstem, it affects the sixth nerve and the seventh nerve. If the lesion is just distal to the, uh, to the brainstem, it affects the seventh nerve and the eighth nerve. If the lesion is distal to the geniculate ganglion, which is located over here, it spares lacrimation. If the lesion is distal to the nerve to the stapedius, it does not cause hyperacusis. If the lesion is distal to the corda tympani, it spares taste to the anterior two-third of the tongue. That's uh, it. Thank you for your attention.